The Methodist Conference this year should have been held in Telford, but of course, because of the COVID-19 pandemic, we found ourselves gathering for a conference in a virtual way, uh, which meant a very different experience for all of us. But of course, there was still important business to be undertaken. And today, those who represented this district at the conference are going to share with you some of their experience and reflect on some of the important conversations and debates that took place within that conference. But before we do that, we want to say a huge thank you to those within the Connectional team who made it possible for us to gather virtually. It was a huge undertaking and much planning was done in a short space of time. But I think that those of us who were there would want to say that it was a good experience of conference, different from those that we had experienced before, perhaps those of us who've attended conference on a number of occasions. So to those of you who were there uh, with me, what was the conference experience like for you this year? Catherine, you've been to conference a number of times before. How did it feel for you compared to other years? Different, but the same. Um, I mean, one of the things I look forward to is, is seeing all the familiar faces and, and catching up on people and of course, when we joined, we just saw the speakers and, and that felt really weird. Um, but I was glad that they were able to do, um, do one workshop where we were in much smaller groups and we could actually have a, a sort of meaningful discussion when we were talking about um, engaging in, in stuff. So I thought that was good, but yeah, it different, but, but the same. Um, there was a lot of humor there as there always is. And I was glad that we were still able to laugh and share. And, and, and I was just, yeah, so glad that we were able to do it. Thanks, Catherine. John, it was your first time at conference this year. How did it feel for you? Obviously very different from what you had anticipated when you were elected last year. Yeah, I felt very privileged to be elected as a, a representative to conference. And uh, on the lead up to conference, I, in my own mind, prepared where I wanted to contribute and not contribute and uh, um, and uh, knew I was going to uh, know my nature, it would have been difficult. I find things uh, contributing difficult. I'd, so I just got my head around. There were some things that, uh, on the agenda that I might want to contribute to and say something. Uh, I found it very, to begin with, very odd um, a way of, um, uh, of dealing with things and very unnatural. Uh, and it made me quite nervous actually. So um, I felt that there was sometimes that I was not able to um, uh, contribute as I would like to um, and there were things left unsaid but that's not about the the format that was about me um, what the good one of the good things was I was able to share some of this with my wife um, we uh, we uh, took the opportunity to listen to some of the things that were open for us all to listen to together and uh, we actually uh, engaged in the uh, devotionals and uh, some of the speeches and uh, we had a, a few laugh or two with um, the, some of the voting and, and that was really very good actually uh, and it left me left a good feeling in the household that it was something that we could share together um, and it opened the opportunity of engaging with conference to many other people that might have felt excluded. In the end, I thought it was a good experience and one that, um, although I wouldn't like to do conference like this again, I, I left, it didn't leave a bad taste in my mouth and I was pleased to be there. Great, thank you, John. I'm sure we'd all agree that uh, we hope that by the time of conference next year, we're able to physically uh, gather again. But as you say, it was still a good experience for uh, those of us who were able to participate in it this year. One of the um, highlights of the conference is often the uh, addresses which are given by the president and the vice president at the beginning uh, of the conference to, to kind of set out their store for the year and, and uh, flesh out the theme that they have chosen. And uh, I wonder if, Lynn, you'd like to just say something to us about what you took away from the vice president's uh, address this year. The Vice President, Evelyn Lawrence, gave a wonderful address on the Saturday afternoon, and that was the start out point of the conference to me. 
the presentation was refreshing and what shone me was her sincerity and the passion of the church for the, the Lord. She set out, she said, to do four things. The first was share something of herself. The second was to give part of her testimony, especially about how she got called to the vice presidency. Then what she said to tell the church what they need to hear and last to encourage. And she's all four in this address. I can't possibly begin to sum it all up, uh, but I would encourage everybody to listen and find it on YouTube as I did the other day and have listen because it's well worth the here. It's about half an hour and it's well worth listening to. But there were a couple of points that out of this uh, outstanding and really stood out to me even more. One was a quote that was quite near the beginning from Heidi Baker. And this was a real encouragement as well as a challenge. God is not about being the mighty, but willing. He's into using amazing people, just one who are prepared to lay their lives down for him. God's not looking for extraordinarily, exceptionally gifted people, just laid down love to Jesus, who carry his glory with transparency and not make it for themselves. And it was obvious that she is king his glory with transparency. And it's something that we all need to hear as now we said do time and time again. The second thing that stood out to me in the address was something that's immensely practical. And as far as we're talking these days about buying in, uh, in the church and just talking about church growth in Brazil, where she'd visited just the COVID. And she looked at the phenomenal growth of the church and needs to identify four particular factors that he felt had led to the growth of the church. And the church that does look to be facing decline. I think that this is a message that we take home and apply across the district, in our circuits and in our churches. The four factors that she identified were first of all, option for God's word. Secondly, a commitment to prayer. Third, a systematic and strategic approach to evangelism, theological training and pastoral care. And last but by no means least, exuberance and joy in worship. And it strikes me that as a church who wants to stop the decline, that we need to take her observations very serious and commit ourselves to four things. Thank you, Lynn. That's a great summary of what uh, the Vice President Carolyn Lawrence had to say to us. And there was much there to encourage us and to challenge us uh, and to inspire us. And of course, she and the President together have taken uh, for their theme this year, the best of all uh, is God is with us. And so we, we hold on to that truth as well as we journey together through this year. One of the other things, of course, that is often a highlight of the conference, but was very different this year, uh, was the reception into full connection. And Ben, uh, you were one of those people who was due to be received into full connection uh, this year. I wonder if you might just give us your perspective on how that felt this year uh, and in the fact that it had to be de dealt with in a virtual way rather than in a physical gathering. Absolutely amazing, uh, for me at least. I absolutely loved it. In fact, I think I probably preferred it to being done um, in what I will refer to as the ordinary way, for want of a better word. Um, I, I spoke quite a lot about it in my testimony, but I just think it was a real leveller for me. Um, for somebody who has a, who works, likes to work with lots of people who come from unchurched or dechurched backgrounds, um, don't have a lot of familiarity with church, it actually meant they they were able to engage with it in a very different way than they would if I tried to drag them along to what often becomes quite a um, procession and drawn out thing. Um, you know, they were able to sit there, they didn't have to worry about what they, what they were wearing or what their children were doing, whether they were making any noise or doing anything wrong, because they could just sit at home and watch it. And it was really lovely then to have all of those messages come in afterwards saying, oh, it's great to be with you. Um, and it was wonderful to be able to do that and, you know, support you in that way, in ways that they probably wouldn't have done if I'd said, can you come to Telford and, <laughs> um, and sit through this church service? Um, so it was really encouraging for people to be able to join in in that way. 
and see, you know, what is quite a key moment in the life of the church, mm. uh, really. And that was fantastic. Yeah. Great. Thanks, Ben. Catherine, how about you as someone who's experienced that in previous years in the physical gatherings? Yeah. How did it feel this year to be part of that virtually? It was, yeah, again, different, but um, I mean, it was just so lovely. I mean, it's one of the things, the highlights, it's the thing I look forward to the most. And, and I'm really looking forward to the actual ordination service to be able to, when we shout at you, it's, it's that you are worthy. Um, it's such a, oh, I get shivers even thinking about it. But for you to each one respond, that moment in that video where we went and saw each one of you in your own, well, I know you weren't where you were, John, but uh, Ben rather, um, but to see that and, and to hear your affirmation and hear your voice saying it, you, you lose that in the crowd. And, and that, was, that was a real highlight, actually, for me, that one of the, the highlights of the conference this year was to be able to hear the ordinance affirming themselves in their own voices. That, that was wonderful. Thanks, Catherine. And yes, of course, we do very much look forward uh, to your ordination, Ben, which we trust is going to be happening in April. Uh, next year. We look forward to that very much indeed. Brilliant. Okay, so we'll move on just to think a little bit about some of the uh, major reports and conversations and debates that we had uh, in the conference. Um, the conference business was very much um, confined to what was considered to be essential business this year, but I think we would want to say that the quality of debate and conferring was not diminished by us being gathered uh, virtually, that there was some very serious and uh, concentrated and focused debate that went on. And there was a good deal of time spent talking about matters relating to equality, diversity and inclusion. And uh, I wonder, um, John, perhaps you first could say something about what you thought was the, the key message that came through those conversations on, on that matter for you. I think uh, it's probably important to say that I came with quite a fixed view of what I thought the Methodist Church meant by inclusion. Uh, and uh, we, we've just you've just mentioned that we weren't able to discuss all of the um, agenda items and Gillow was missing off that. Uh, and one of the feelings that I had prior to the conference was that inclusion was really mainly uh, uh, about uh, the content of the uh, Gillow um, report. And when I when I listened to the delegates, I was really heartened that actually in Methodism, um, contrary to my belief or opinion, uh, which it, it really spoke to me, there was a desire for true inclusion. And inclusion means uh, enabling people from different academic abilities, different social um, strata, uh, different uh, uh, cultures and colours uh, 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 and nationalities. And it, it as well as people from... Uh, when we discuss uh, Gillu and sexuality and all of those matters. Uh, and I was really, really heartened to hear delegates speak about uh, how inclusion matters uh, and, uh, uh, and also about some of the connectional representatives where um, I thought that it was quite a narrow field. Uh, and uh, it made me feel a, a, quite a lot better about uh, the Methodist Church and, and, and their ideals. Um, it kind of took the blinkers off for me uh, for what people were considering uh, about inclusion. Obviously, we're not there yet. Uh, and it, I, I had a conversation with somebody recently saying, in my backyard, which is where I serve, we have um, a, a, a mixture of race. Um, we have a mi mixture of academic ability and social, um, uh, different people on different social levels. Um, and uh, in, in my backyard, where I see Methodism failing is not being able to engage with those people with use of language, use of written work. And what I heard was there's a desire. And as long as there's a desire and you start that walk, you may finish it. But if you don't start the walk, you're never going to get there. Mm. What I heard there was a desire to include all people and it wasn't just a narrow agenda, as I've previously felt it was. And that's really very encouraging to me um, and uh, worthy of note, I think. Thank you, John. We'll just make sure that everybody knows what you mean by Gilu. That's the God in Love Unites Us report, which, of course, we weren't uh, debating this no. year, but which we will be debating uh, in the conference next year. Margaret, I think you might also want to say something about what you took away from 
um, the equality, diversity and inclusion uh, conversations as well. Yeah, thank you, Jill. I found this year's um, discussions on EDI quite an opening for me, particularly on that issue that John mentioned about in including other aspects of our Christian life. I more or less had a narrow vision of what EDI covers, but I realized it covers quite a range of other issues that we encounter on our journey of faith. And um, I came this year thinking particularly more on um, the statement that will say that, um, that we are a diverse, we are an inclusive church. But again and again, we need to hear that racism is a denial mm. of the gospel. And mm. I would like something, you know, I thought it's not only racism, but denying or overlooking or being discriminative to somebody who is physically a name uh, or I've got much as that are concerning of education or whatever background they come from. That in itself is what would Jesus do? The WWD. So I came up with, I came out of that conference thinking more. And then another issue that caught my attention more and more was the Black Lives Matter. And I found myself thinking more and more, what does that really mean? Because obviously all lives matter. But why is it that overtaking us? And I, th I thought, I came up with thinking, with the thinking of that Animal Farm book of George, uh, oh, uh, George, Oh well. Uh, oh well, that's right, George Orwell. All animals are equal, but some are more equal than others. Given to what many people from uh, many black life people have gone through right from through the centuries, there has been that it's okay, it's a it's a race that is below others. And that you know we can do our research and find and ask ourselves. Where did we come up with the idea of white and black? If you look at this paper, it's white. If you look at my phone case, it's black. And I don't look black. I, and Jill, you don't look white. So why did we put that? Was it because of a superiority of white and black? How do we come to name when we were when we write things are on alphabetical order? We begin our, you know, we list with by our names on um, minutes, minutes of conference, reverend, so on, and it's all listed in alphabetical orders. But when we come to fill the and the and the, and the form of oh dear, the names is gone. We begin by W white, Asian. Why yes. can't we talk? you know, the other way, alphabetically, because that leads us to the next thing that um, I'll, I'll talk about. But I felt this year's conference needs us to reawaken again and again and listen to what people are saying on the streets at the demonstrations of Black Lives Matter. Indeed, I said again, all lives matter. But why, particularly this time, we know the history. Of Thank, you. Thank you, Margaret. And, and Indigit is going to help us think a little bit more about that um, in, our, in, our, in our synod uh, later today. Um, one of the things that emerged from those conversations about equality, diversity and inclusion was the recommendation that unconscious bias training um, is going to be required for many more groups and committees in the life of the church. What do you think is at the heart of that move and that decision, Margaret? I think it will make us aware that we are all biased one way or another. And taking this unconscious bias training will expose our unconscious bias that we all have, as I just said. The training will provide tools to adjust to automatic patterns of thinking with the hope that such a training will eliminate any discriminatory 
but behaviors. So I think it will be a, a training that will expound, expose where we are unconscious about certain things, be it during interviews, be it during church councils, be it stationing, all those will, we all have some kind of preconceived ideas unknowingly and taking that training will expose and will be more aware of how, and how biased we are and is to try to think the other way, yeah. Yeah, thank, thank you, Margaret. And certainly we're going to see that training uh, rolled out uh, across the district uh, and indeed across the connection in the future. Um, one of the other major reports that came um, to conference this year was the God for All report, which uh, embraces the evangelism and growth strategy. And I wonder, Ben, I think you're going to just help us uh, understand a little bit about some of the key messages for the church um, in that report. Oh gosh, yeah, where to start? It is an absolutely huge report. Uh, it has taken uh, a long time to get to this point. Trey Hall um, has been working on it along with his team um, and they've done consultations. Uh, they did say how many, but I've forgotten what that number was. I'm sorry, up and down the connection in districts and even in some circuits, I think. Um, us trying to get to grips with what the church believes evangelism is and how best to go about doing that uh, and drawing things together. Um, and they really want it to be centered in God. That's one of the headings in the report. Um, so the president and vice president are calling for this to be a year of prayer as part of that. Um, and also a, um, the Methodist way of life that Roger Walton has been uh, developing has sort of had a soft launch already and has got a bit more of a formal launch coming up, I believe, um, for us all to try and think about how we might be all evangelists. So everyone an evangelist is also another little subheading in the report, um, looking at developing a culture of testimony, of sharing those stories of what God is doing in each of our lives, in our churches, circuits, districts, and across the whole connection. Um, because obviously we believe in a, a God that is alive, don't we? Uh, not, a, not a God that is just um, resigned to, to a textbook, essentially. Uh, you know, our God is still alive. Um, so building on that culture of testimony um, and training and releasing dedicated evangelists um, and trying to build together a national program of evangelists where we can uh, come together as a church, uh, as a whole connection across the country uh, together to stand up and say things together uh, and speak um, of God's love, God's commitment to us. Um, and, and the things that God might be doing. Um, they're also suggesting that they employ a um, lecturer at Queen's Foundation who are involved in ministerial training um, to teach transformational leadership and evangelism, um, which I think sounds fascinating, a little bit upsetting. I'm not going to get that training um, in that way, um, but maybe, maybe something else will come along uh, for the rest of us. Um, perhaps a really, really big thing is the new places for new people. Uh, which we really want to recognize that if the Methodist church is to continue and to survive, it's not just about maintaining what we have, but taking the message of God's love and commitment and faithfulness to his creation out to people who perhaps have walked away from church or have never been to church, have never felt that love of God before. And not just expecting them to come into old places, so not trying to put new wine in old wineskins, um, but actually developing new societies with them. Um, and if we look at the way that Methodism has worked in the past, uh, that is perhaps a little bit of how our ecclesiology really was set up around the, the forming of new societies where people were. Um, and particularly focusing on church at the margins, which is another subheading, there's lots of them. Mm -hmm. um, church at the margins, recognizing that, you know, it seems to perhaps, perhaps God has a preferential bias for those that are marginalized, those at the edge, um, those that are shoved to the side by other people. Um, so that ties in with that equality, inclusion and diversity things that we were just hearing about. You know, actually those people that everyone else kind of just pushes to the side and, and tries to push down and sit on. Um, God says, well, actually, they're really important. Aren't? It really says we want to work with those indigenous leaders with them, not to them, not for them, but with them um, to try and build this culture, uh, this new people of faith. Uh, well, I say new people, you know, building our people of faith, um, really. They want every church to be a growing church. They want to deliberately focus on doing some work on young evangelists, pioneers and leaders. Um, they want every district going back to new places for new people to have a new place for new people within the next three years. 
I think the districts are being given the option to self-select which year they're going for. So the connectional team will work with every district across the connection at some point in the next three years um, to develop a new place for new people, at least one in every district, perhaps more. Um, and finally, then the last point, which is very apt after coronavirus, is they wanted to do some work on the digital presence, so ministry in a digital age. Um, but if you want to know more about that, you'll have to go and read the report. It's huge, it's massive, but it's really important to me because it is what we're about. It is about saying we're not just about keeping going what we've got. It is about taking that message of God, which has an urgency, doesn't it? God's, God's message, God's love does have a sense of urgency to it, or at least it does in my heart. Um, so having this spoken about at a conference this year uh, was really encouraging and uplifting for me to hear that we're not just about trying to keep going and going and going with how things work, but taking that living God and that love of that living God out to new people is really exciting. Thanks, Ben. That's great. And we're going to hear something about how this district is going to engage with that New Places uh, for New People initiative that you just mentioned a bit later uh, in the Synod as well. But of course, um, if people are going to have uh, time and energy and be released from other things in order to um, get really involved in that evangelism and growth strategy that's been uh, devised by the connectional team. Um, there may be some other things that we need to let go of. And one of the other reports that we focused on uh, in part this year was uh, a report about oversight and trusteeship and the ways in which that might be able to support the changing face of the church as it's envisioned by the evangelism and growth strategy. Catherine, I wonder if you can help us to just understand some of the things that were in that uh, report. Um, I'm not quite sure I fully understood all of it myself. I think it's a report that needs a lot of reading and rereading. And I think it's very easy to pick up on the, the sort of the, the, the headlines and think, oh, they want to close the small churches because there seems to be a lot of debate around that. Um, and my impression was that that's not the intention. They don't want to close the churches. They, they want to enable the churches to continue their work. They just want to free them from some of the restrictions and the responsibilities that, that are, are required of them. And um, the, the debate was fascinating. And I, I, think, I think you can still, I'm not sure, can we still watch the, the debates that went out? I can't remember when they bring the, take the videos down, but it was interesting hearing them. Um, the phrase that, that really stuck was the one that your, your husband brought forward to suggest that um, satsumas are not small oranges. And that just because you're small does not mean that you don't have a purpose and coming from a church that is relatively small I think um, and, and seems to be dwindling and is really struggling with a lot of the issues of how do we keep going with what we're legally required to do with fewer and fewer people yet we still have a passion for, for our, our place and our situation. Um, I actually found it quite encouraging but it, as I say it's a report I think it we should be reading it and and not just focusing on on what seems to be said but actually understanding the intention behind it yeah you're absolutely right Catherine the intention is that we reduce the number of people that need to be trustees but that's not the same as reducing the number of places of worship or Christian communities and so we'll be talking a lot more about that in our uh, local churches and circuits over the, the coming uh, year or two I'm sure as we seek to uh, put that into practice Okay, well, our time um, for sharing our feedback is drawing to a close. And I wonder, um, Ben, as someone who was not a, a rep this year, but, but someone who, for whom this conference was very significant, I wonder if you'd just like to close for us by uh, sharing with us what you think uh, the key message is that you brought away from the conference, uh, which you want the rest of the district to hear and to know. Sure, yeah, okay, so no pressure. Um, so I think... I think uh, the, I, the idea for me uh, of what I took away from conference this year was that when, when things are getting difficult, which it has been in Methodism for a little while now, um, but particularly, uh, you know, especially now with COVID as well, it, the temptation is always to kind of separate ourselves off and say, well, I've got to protect my, my circuit or my church. Um, my chapel, my congregation, but that actually the way, the way we, we work through this, the way that God, um, intends us to live is in in connection with one another and together um, and so really our best chance of surviving and carrying God's message further into the future is by pulling together working together that does involve some hard choices perhaps but actually also looking to the future has immense promises with it and immense opportunities so I think the real message for me is about 
is a renewal of connectionalism, of saying it's not just about trying to protect our own little bit of, of the kingdom, it's about trying to build the kingdom together. Wonderful. Thank you, Ben. So I hope you can all see that even though this year's conference uh, had a very different feel to it, and there were some important matters that we chose not to discuss this year, we were still able to engage in some really good quality conferring and conversation. And we are incredibly grateful, as I said at the beginning, to all those who made that possible. I hope you've heard from some of our representatives here uh, that we actually discussed some things that have I've got us quite excited about the future and, and that we're part of a church that is focusing on sharing God's story, on making new disciples, on enabling all of us who are part of the church to be freed up from some of the things that so often uh, weigh us down to really do that which is most important and that is proclaiming uh, the love of God and sharing it with our neighbours. There are lots of other matters that we discussed that we haven't had time to mention here today. Um, but if you've got any questions about what happened at the conference or about any of the decisions that were made there, then please don't hesitate to be in touch with me uh, or uh, I, I dare to suggest with any of those here who represented uh, the district at the conference this year.